If you would, please turn to the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel chapter 10. And I'm just going to uh, quickly uh, here answer a couple of questions uh, as we are going to go into a study we just did this past Wednesday night. But I, I don't believe that um, we um, adequately covered it, uh, especially with regard to the Old and New Covenant, uh, and that there were a lot of furrowed brows and the like. And so again, we'll be uh, taping these because uh, the person who asked about this um, uh, couldn't be here this Sunday, but we'll be back and we'll get it for them on, uh, on tape. But um, in Daniel chapter 10, I want you to, uh, uh, to note something here. Uh, verse number 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of uh, Persia. Uh, and uh, then you'll come on down here to, uh, to verse number um, uh, 20, where it says, uh, I'm going to return uh, with the prince of Persia, and I've gone forth, and the prince of Grisha is going to come. Now you'll note that uh, these people referred to here as kings, did I, uh, <laughs> Okay. See, if I don't get excited, I'll put him a little piggy friend up there. I just uh, you go and forget it. Okay, that's all right. Uh, the question was, um, when we sing little choruses and, and songs sometimes talking about uh, the Lord Jesus being a king, uh, is it necessarily wrong? Well, if we're associating ourselves with his earthly kingship and being part of that kingdom, which so many do, then you have to take a good look at it and say, well, all right, well, uh, we might ought to change those words and uh, something uh, along that nature. However, uh, as we just read here in Daniel 10, angels are called princes uh, and kings. And this matter of him being the, the king of kings trickles down not just to earth, but all the way through the second heaven to earth. And in essence, you and I that replace the angels on these thrones are also called principalities or princes and or kings. And so when you're talking about him being the king of the universe, as he, as the son of God, sits at God the Father's right hand, then in that sense, he is still our king. Uh, and uh, Paul calls him uh, the potentate, which is the mighty, uh, Dunestes, the mighty prince. Uh, but this prince is also a king and that God the Father has delegated to him the second highest authority in the entire universe at his right hand. Okay, so uh, as long as we keep his kingship along these lines, then he is our king. But uh, whenever you're explaining it to somebody and that they talk about him being a king and that, that sort of thing and coming back with him to reign on the earth, he is not our king as the, as the king of Israel. Uh, all right, now let's notice something else here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, there is a difference categorically and doctrinally between salvation and sanctification. And when we come up to uh, the Bema seat here uh, to get rewards, uh, it was pointed out, and rightly so, that most folks think that the Bema seat uh, is a, uh, uh, there so that we can get salvation. And that when we're raptured up there, that's what we're going to get. Well, unless you have believed Paul's gospel, the only people that will be at the Bema seat getting rewards are those who have believed Paul's gospel. 
Now, uh, that has to do with salvation. And therefore, we can cross this out as a reason for being at the Bema. Salvation is given to you and to me this side of the Bema seat. And the only way you get to be there is that you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, what is it all about? Uh, the Bema seat is about sanctification, learning the Christian way of life and living it, redeeming the time, spending time in, in the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit and having Him direct your life to obey God's Word across the spectrum. And uh, it's then that you stand there before the Lord Jesus Christ, not to get salvation, but to get rewards for sanctification. And so that's what the, the works uh, are about. Verse 12, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. If any man's work shall be made manifest, the day is going to declare it revealed by fire. It's going to try, this is verse 13, every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built, he'll receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. You see, salvation is not the issue. If you're there, you're saved. But what the issue is, did you live your life, gold, godliness, silver, uh, neutralizing the old sin nature, fellowship uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit, His power, uh, and precious stones, that, that uh, indicates volitional decisions to obey God in the, uh, these areas. And so if you do this, uh, you'll get rewards. If not, you'll still be saved, yet so as by fire. The fire burns away the bad, uh, and you only enter in with the good. Now, that's um, we call this um, skin of your teeth salvation. Um, uh, you're, you're saved, yet so as by fire. Everything else is gone, but a minimal glorified body. Uh, and uh, you don't go to hell, but it's not the most glorious way to enter eternity future either. <laughs> so the glorious way is to be rewarded to the maximum. People with, with minimal rewards don't glorify Christ because they didn't live for Him during time. People that get rewards are those who are going to forever be seen through His eyes as those that, that have, have sacrificed for Him and lived for Him and suffered for Him. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, see where, where I am here. There we want to go. And... Uh, the first thing we're going to do is go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And introduce you to a question we had, a study we had this past Wednesday night. Where Jesus Christ makes makes a statement, and uh, we believe that he is making this statement in re relationship to the human spirit container here, and the human body here, and of course uh, the, the volitional decision is a, a given in the illustration, simply because without the volitional decision there, there is no uh, further action taken on God's part. But all of a sudden, as he's going through um, uh, the book of Matthew here, there are those who disbelieve. And he makes this statement in verse number 16. No man puts a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. For that which is put um, uh, in to fill it up takes from the garment. I mean, the, the garment uh, is, you know, kind of bleached. Uh, it's been, the color's been washed out. It's been worn quite a while. You've got some tatters and tears in it. And now you've got this big tear. Uh, what you have to do is get comparable uh, material to, to fill in the tear. If you put new, all of a sudden it, it's a glaring thing. Uh, you can see, well, well, that doesn't look right. That's incompatible and so forth. And that's what he's saying. The rent is made worse. Neither do men put new into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runs out, and the bottles perish. But they uh, that put new wine into new bottles uh, have both preserved. Now, he gives this illustration in light of the fact 
that he just forgave the sins, indicating this area here of, of the fellow who exercised faith, and he healed a person. Uh, and that's, uh, that's directed toward his body. The garment here is the body, and the wine put in the, the vessel is the, the regenerated human spirit. Now, you've got to understand how in the world he comes up with these things, because often here's what people do. They take these verses, lift them right from their context, and forget how much material has been taught to the nation of Israel from Adam to this point about the Old and the New Covenant, and that one was coming who would be the representative of the New Covenant, which gave both the forgiveness of sins and permanent healing. Now, do they have resurrection under the concept of Old Covenant? Or is it the New Covenant that gives a new body and eternal life? Which? It's the New. The Old Covenant was temporary. Their, their sacrifices couldn't take away sins. Their sacrifices remembered sins every year. And as long as that happens, you still have people whose sins are remembered against them. Uh, even though they're in the body, I mean in, in, the, in the grave, even though they're believers, you have to have a, a new dynamic. And that new dynamic is the new covenant. So that's what we have here as we look at the um, verse number uh, one. He entered into a ship, passed over, and came to his own city. And they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, uh, lying on a bed. Jesus, seeing their faith. Now all of them, the, he was born of four, and this guy had faith himself. He said to the sick of the palsy, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now that, that's, that's very, very strange. Well, why would Jesus Christ say that when he's going to heal the body? Well, Christ is now moving toward the center and end of his earthly ministry with Israel. He is about to face the cross where his body and blood are going to be the representations of the new covenant and the ratification for it. He now is going to have to begin teaching the nation of Israel that the old covenant does not save, and it's the new covenant. And so certain of the scribes, uh, uh, and in other parts it talked about uh, the, the Pharisees and so forth, said within themselves, this man blasphemes. Uh, in other parts it says, who can forgive sins but God only? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? What's easier to say? Thy sins are forgiven thee, or arise and walk. Now, the reason that he says this is because the new covenant provides for permanent forgiveness of sins and the permanent elimination of, of Adam's original sin and the sin nature, there, therefore the resurrection body. The old covenant, though, though there were predictions about a resurrection, the old covenant does not provide permanent forgiveness of sins or a resurrection body. Even for Israel, and that's what we're going to do uh, all day, the rest of this day, think of ourselves in terms of Israel in light of these settings and, and understand that they had to, to um, uh, comprehend the old and new covenant, what one could do and could not do, and what the other promised. And so it says, verse number five again, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and walk. Why? Well, according to the new covenant, if he healed the body, what did he have to do? Forgive the sins. According to the new covenant, if he forgave all sins, what did he have to do to the body? <laughs> Heal the body. <laughs> and so it, it becomes extremely clear now why he's going to give this matter of patching an old garment or putting new wine in an old garment. Because the new covenant provides for complete forgiveness of sins, never to be remembered against them anymore, and a resurrection body that is, that is comparable to that of Christ's resurrection body. Now, uh, as we're, let's see, I think here's where we want to go. No, there's where we want to go. You will remember that grace comes right here. 
The dispensation of grace was an interruption in the program of Israel before they got their kingdom. But the law literally is the old covenant. This entire dispensation is the old covenant. And the, when the kingdom is brought in, that is the new covenant. Now we're going to get rid of the dispensation of grace here and we're going to go on. Jesus Christ is giving this illustration at this point because uh, as, as Israel's time marches forward under the dispensation of law, you have the tribulation period instead of grace and you don't have Christ coming back until the end of that point and at the end of that point now you have that which is new. But if you've got something new here, what happens to the old? It's replaced. And that is the teaching here. Uh, it is the teaching of people as they have the new covenant applied to them. And, and what it is, is though they're still under the old covenant, this is what's called a token miracle. And, and, and a lot of folks don't uh, get what Jesus was doing here. Everybody that was healed by Christ in his day, what happened to them shortly thereafter? They all died. <laughs> Well, what's that mean? It's a token. It's a symbol or a picture. If he can give somebody forgiveness of sins and healing of the body here, then what he promised in the kingdom with an entire forgiveness of sins, an entire forgiveness of the body can happen if they will simply believe in him. Now, when, when uh, the kingdom comes, what happens on the last day of, of the dispensation of law and, and the first day of the, of the dispensation of the kingdom? Okay, let's, let's go here to John 11. John 11. And where it says, verse 23, Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, the resurrection at the last day of the dispensation of law ends law so that these people can do what? Enter into the kingdom based upon which covenant with Israel? The new covenant. Uh, and so their, their resurrection coincides with, with those events. The very last day of Israel, the very first day of the kingdom. And they're there in glorified bodies. Why can they be there in a glorified body? Well, you say, you know, what everybody else says, Jesus Christ was raised here because he lives. Uh, yes, that's true. But as long as we keep thinking those things, that's, that gives us a superficial understanding of what's going on. His body is a prototype of what a new covenant glorified body is. And they couldn't have these things until the new covenant is ratified and is, is evident on the earth. Uh, here it is just, it is just be, it, it established. Here it is actually ratified when the kingdom comes. And so when you get to thinking of what he said here about the old garment and about the old wineskin uh, and about just patching over something and, and about giving something brand new, you have to understand it in light of these things. Now, we're going to uh, allow you to, to copy these things if you like. Uh, I'll keep them on the board. And just this is going to be our, our outline generally in our study. Usually we, when we have law, what's the other dispensation we have over there? Grace. <laughs> and we have been so, excuse this phrase, immersed. <laughs> we have been, been so keyed into thinking that the next dispensation is grace that we forget that it was a mystery to those who are under law and that they were looking toward the kingdom. And so to understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have to understand these two dispensations, not grace. The apostle Peter never knew about grace till Paul to told him. So here's what you have. 
You have the dispensation here called law. You have the dispensation here called kingdom. The law was built on the old covenant. That's what started it. When Israel ratified the Mosaic covenant or the old covenant, that started it until a new covenant is going to be um, uh, valid on the earth. This covenant is called the first one. The new covenant is called the second one. Now, sometimes this is misleading because, man, they're, they're, Israel has so many covenants and, and so many rider covenants, it's pitiful. But, but what the, God is trying to do in the Bible is talk about foundational covenants upon which his, his dealings will be uh, with Israel temporarily and permanently. The one is built upon animal blood, which can never take away sins. That's why if you lived under the uh, old covenant, if there was no promise of a new, I'd be very depressed. <laughs> because just when you think, I, I shame myself to put my head on, I mean, my hands on the head of that beast and sacrifice him, a, a sin offering, and everybody saw it. Now here comes the day of atonement when I've got to remember those things again and do the very same thing. So over here, you have human blood. But not just any human blood. In order to, for it to be a new covenant, you, you have to have a different kind of blood than animal blood. You have to have, it's humans who sinned, it's humans that have to be sacrificed. But not just any type of human blood. It had to be perfect human blood. That's why Jesus says, take, drink, this, uh, uh, this represents my blood. Take, eat, this represents my body. The body and blood are, are issues in the new covenant. All right? The one is temporary. The new covenant is permanent. God doesn't have another new covenant. God doesn't have a rider on the back of this one. What you see in the new covenant is what you get. And if, if eternity future cannot, for Israel cannot be realized on this basis, it will never be. All right? He wrote externally on tables of stone under the old covenant, something to live up to. He writes permanently on tables of flesh, indicating a change of nature. It's, 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 uh, it's not second nature, it's first nature. I will write my laws in their hearts and cause them to do them. That's different than if you'll do them, I will do this. And then, in keeping with our illustration here, uh, the Old Covenant provided limited healing. But the New Covenant provides a resurrection body. Would you call that permanent healing? <laughs> I certainly would. Okay, now let's, let's begin to, to look at, uh, at some of these things um, in, in light of it, all right? Well, let's, we, can, we can keep this. Come with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. The book of Hebrews... Chapter 8. And note verse number 13. In that God says a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. When we get to, uh, did, did I, I gave the chapter and verse and book, okay, oh yeah, glory be. <laughs> All right. I, I, I had to practice a lot and said that we're going to do this. When Christ gave this illustration of the old and the new here, and that miracle involving both the bodily healing and the total for, and the forgiveness of sins, he is teaching them a lesson about what's going to happen when the new covenant is here. The old, the old garment is not going to be patched. 
it's, he's going to have a new garment, a new body. The old wineskin is not going to be used. He's going to put new wine in a new body. But those things are yet future. This was a token or a symbol of what's coming up. So even that guy didn't get the permanent effects. But what he's beginning to do is to teach Israel that the, the old is beginning to vanish away. They were, they were just, just a, a, a couple of years before the cross. And, and at, at the cross, the new covenant potential, NC is the new covenant potential is going uh, to be realized. All right? Uh, and note again uh, what is said here. He saith a new covenant, he hath made the first, that's where we get the, the word first, old. So you have new and old, you have first, Go to verse number seven. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Let's go to our illustration. And, and here we've got, the, we'll, we'll look at law and kingdom here in just a little bit. All right? Obviously, when God here in Israel's program, as they were looking toward the future, you get Jeremiah, you get Ezekiel, uh, who uh, these guys lived, uh, uh, and Isaiah and so forth. These guys lived uh, in the 800 BCs and the, in the 600 BCs and the 500 BCs. These guys begin to look to the future and say, here's what God says. I'm going to make a new covenant. <laughs> I wish we could erase that from the tape. I'm losing my voice. I, I hate sissy sounded voices. New covenant. Well, all right. We can't take it from the tape. Those listening will understand. <clears throat> but uh, for some reason, it's weakening. Uh, and this is called the first. and You've got a second. Now, by the time you, you get to the Lord Jesus Christ and that miracle, you are approaching the kingdom. How do we know that? How do we know that the kingdom is, is close by? Come with me to Matthew 3. And it says, verse number one, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is one with the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse three, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, why, uh, why is this significant? Simply because the prophets here prophesied that God was going to do something with Israel in the wilderness. And that was, he had divorced Israel, and because of her uh, uh, adultery, because of her fornication, because of her idols, because they had broken the covenant, and he flat divorced her. But it says he's going to remarry her. Well, what's he going to do? Well, they're going to have this wilderness trek. <laughs> and, it's, and that's what he does. Isaiah and some of the other prophets say, I'm going to speak softly to her in the wilderness. I'm going to bring her to the wilderness and speak to her and, and, uh, and tell her, okay, look, uh, let's patch things up and get remarried here. And you know uh, who John the Baptist was? He was the person who brought Israel to the wilderness and began to speak to her. The voice of one who cries in the wilderness, the Lord's coming, repent the kingdoms that has just right down the road here. And he began to, to speak. So it's significant. The prophets say that he's going to do this in the wilderness. By the way, when the remnant flees in the last half of the tribulation period, where does she flee to? The wilderness where God speaks uh, to her and protects her and so forth. Uh, and that because the, the remnant is uh, going to be the bride. God's going to get remarried, <laughs> you, you say, uh, to Israel. So that's the significance here. 
John the Baptist now, though he is, is the last of the so-called Old Testament prophets, he is the first, a, a, a signal here, that God is changing gears over to the New Testament because they're approaching the kingdom. And what is going to happen in the kingdom? John the Baptist says, it's at hand. Now, let's look at uh, chapter 4 here. Uh, yeah, verse number 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Uh, verse 24. They brought unto him all sick people that were, uh, were taken with uh, different diseases, torments, possessed uh, a lunatic, and he healed them. How did he heal them? Okay. He healed them. He started healing them on the basis of the new covenant. Why? Well, what's, what's going to be in effect when the kingdom comes? The new covenant. The kingdom's at hand. Repent. Uh, and uh, there, there's the remission of sins. If you'll come here to... Um, to uh, uh, Chapter number, let, let's go to, to chapter 9. Now you remember that in chapter 9 we have the healing of the paralytic born of four. We just read that. Son, your sins be forgiven. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Or vice versa. What's the difference? And then the, the uh, illustration here. And let's go to verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness. And if you come on down to, to uh, verse 1 of chapter 10, he called his twelve together and gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness in light of this message. Note verse 7. As ye go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and so forth. Now, you, you have to understand that by the time you get to the earthly ministry of Christ and the post-cross call of, of salvation, we're entering new covenant ground. Come to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Now, again, you remember that volition is understood as either being positive or negative. But as, as we, we look here in uh, chapter 26, note what Christ says. Where am I? The verse number 26. Notice the two issues in the new covenant, Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them all and said, drink. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. Note verse 29. I will not henceforth uh, drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you. Where? In my Father's kingdom. Okay, now. What's, what's the significance of, of the Lord's table to Israel? The first thing he did was to point out his body. What did Jesus Christ do with, uh, with regard to sins and iniquity in the body? Well, come back to Matthew 8. This is New Covenant territory. Matthew chapter 8. And verse number 16. This is why his body was given. Paul talks about uh, his body uh, being given there, dying for sin in the flesh. 
And it's sin in the flesh that causes what for us? Sickness. If the ground had not been cursed uh, and our bodies taken from the ground, our bodies wouldn't be cursed. And therefore, it took not, not the body of an animal, it took the body of Christ. Uh, not the blood of an animal, it took the blood of Christ. But the first thing we have to note is that Jesus Christ in the new covenant makes mention of his body. What for? For, for healing and resurrection and never getting sick again. Verse number, um, uh, let's back up to verse 14. When Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick with a fever. He touched her and the fever left her. Verse number uh, 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, cast out spirits, healed all the sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet himself, that is in his body, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. You do not have the promise of resurrection <laughs> based on anything but the new covenant. In the dispensation of grace, we, we get the body and the blood of, of the Lord uh, by grace and not by covenant. But you remember, we, we eat the bread. We just don't drink the cup. We eat the bread. Why? Because in context there, 1 Corinthians 11, you just come a few chapters over to chapter 15. And what does Paul talk about the entire chapter? Resurrection, transformation, not being mortal anymore, but being immortal. Not having corruptness anymore, but exchanging that for, an, uh, for a, a, a non-corrupt body. Why is that? Because when Jesus died on the cross, for Israel first, and then for us as the part of the mystery, he took our curse and infirmities there. Okay, now let's, um, let's look at the... Um, uh, the second thing with regard to blood. The, the, the blood was given us for the remission of sins. All right. Let's uh, take a look at that in the book of Hebrews. Just quickly. Book of Hebrews. Chapter Nine. Now, in this study of the of the old and new covenant, and in this study of the new covenant, uh, in the two parts of body and blood, we now can better appreciate our own that. I knew it was killing y'all when y'all are doing this. We now can understand our own salvation a little better. Because we can, we can look at this entire, well, I will put a smiley face for crying out loud. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, it would be hard to explain church to somebody else. You have to be there. <laughs> Where am I? Okay. Verse, verse number seven. Where, where it says, But into the second uh, tabernacle or veil went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood. He offered for himself and his people. The Holy Ghost signifying the way into the holiest was not made manifest while the first tabernacle. See, there's, a, there's another first and second. The first tabernacle, second tabernacle. We didn't list those, I don't believe. Figure of those things then uh, present. But they were imposed, says verse 10, until the time of Reformation. What is the time of Reformation? The kingdom. When you're under law, and this is how it is under law, but then you get reformed or refreshed or renewed, uh, according to uh, Acts 3, when the kingdom comes. So Christ, being a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. So, verse 12, 
neither by the blood of goats and bulls, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Well, there's, there's another great contrast there uh, as we're looking at, at these things. Many times here, once here. Uh, because this covenant is temporary. It only covered sins. It, it only did certain things. Yes, it was good in its day. But, but God upgraded to that which was going to be permanent. And uh, the permanent is, is the blood of Christ. He, uh, verse thir- uh, 12 says, He obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, that is temporarily, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offer himself without spot to God? For this cause, he's the mediator of a new covenant. And then if you look down in verse number 15, even for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first prominent uh, covenant, that they might receive the promise of eternal uh, salvation or inheritance. So um, our time is, is beginning to, um, uh, to um, uh, get away from us here. Uh, I'm go- I think what I'm going to do tonight when we start, I'm going to add a few more things to, to this list uh, and we'll, we'll go through them. But uh, let's look right now at body or bodies under law and body under grace and then we'll be done. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 11. Under the law, not just hundreds, not just thousands, but millions of animals were slaughtered. Millions of them. That's why it's bodies, plural. Every year, thousands, but as you count the years, millions were slaughtered. From the day the tabernacle was instituted um, uh, and, and on. But verse number 11 says, For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, they're burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the camp. That's why there is an emphasis, come back to chapter 10, on not just the blood, but the body. We'll look at this verse, go to another illustration, ask a couple of questions, make some comments, and we're done. All right? It says, verse 1, The law had a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of those things. Can never with those sacrifices, body and blood, which they offered year by year, make the comers thereunto perfect, for then they would not have ceased to be, uh, or rather, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Answer, yes. Because that the worshipers once purged would have no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's remembrance of sin year by year. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So, what happened? Verse 5. For when he uh, cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering, the bodies uh, and blood of those animals, thou wouldest not, but a body with blood have you prepared me. So, uh, Jesus Christ had both. Now, here's where we're going to, to end up. What are the two things... Uh, with regard to the healing of that uh, um, palsied man born of four, did Jesus say that indicate the two aspects of the new covenant? He said, first of all, son, thy what? Sins be forgiven you. The new covenant provides for forgiveness of sins. And if you have forgiveness of sins based on his faith, 
you have regeneration in the human spirit. Okay? Now we just saw that, that really regeneration, even under law, was, is provided for by the new covenant, not the old. We just read that verse. All right. Under the new covenant, if you have your sins forgiven, what else automatically follows? You have a new body. You have a regeneration, as it were, of your body. And so as we begin looking at this old garment patched, no, it's a totally new garment. Old wine skin filled with new wine, no, it's, it's new and new. You come to understand that what Christ is teaching them is this illustration that the old is beginning to pass away. And with the kingdom being at hand, the new covenant was about to be implemented. And it's on that basis that God is going to relate to Israel and all saved.